Welcome to Old Ways Gardening and Prepping. My name is Teresa, and I'd like to welcome you on another adventure. We're fixing ahead to the Herb Society um, meeting for the month of February. Uh, we're going to have a really good guest speaker. I haven't heard him talk before, so don't know if I'm going to agree, but we're going to see and see what we can learn. See you here in a bit. They've changed the beautiful artwork into wild native pictures. Beautiful artwork, beautiful pictures, so beautiful. Golden rods. Trying to make sure there's no glare. Absolutely beautiful. Teachers Credit Union, which I think is now called Ohio 
Um, so we converted a bank. Uh, Greg started that process several years ago, uh, probably back in 13 and 14. Greg to the audits who I bought the business from. Like Kathy said, we did slowly put a new roof on, solar array system, painted the building, uh, really opened up a lot on the inside. Um, so if y'all come by, hopefully it won't feel like a bank uh, anymore. It'll feel like a kind of a garden oasis. Yeah, it's fun. It's a really fun place. We've got cats, ducks, and always something crazy going on. Uh, but I'm glad to be here. Uh, I think, I don't, I don't remember exactly what was in the bio, but I'm, I'm actually from Middle Tennessee originally, uh, Sumner County. Grew up on a produce and tobacco farm. And came to Rhodes College, that's how I got to learn that this, this was a complete culture shock for me at first. You know, <clears throat> coming from a little bitty town, dirt roads, really just dairy farms and, and us around. And, uh, but Memphis is very much part of me now. And um, what I love about the city is the grit um, and, you know, the hustling. You know, it really is like the farm. You know, it's kind of like the same mentality, I think. So I love Memphis and I consider this my home, raising my kids here. Glad to be here, glad to be in front of the Earth Society. Kathy asked me to talk a little bit about, um, this is, this is um, a logo, and this is the website if you want to go to it, um, what you can see here. Um, but we talked about something seasonally appropriate. One of the things, I actually love winter. Uh, I hope y'all do too in your garden. I know it can feel, especially on days like today, the last thing you want to be doing or thinking about you know, is a garden, but this is really you know, the contemplative time of year. Um, and certainly one that, um, you know, if you can enjoy that, be at peace with, you know, kind of a you know, kind of quiet in the garden, I think that can be a great time to do a lot of, um, you know, thought about it. We'll talk about those things that you can do this time of year. Um, and we are, you know, kind of on the cusp of spring, so if you ain't done much in the garden or thought about much in it, you've uh, got just a little bit more time to come. Um, so here's your list, and uh, I'm happy if y'all want to email me, I've got some cards. Um, send this to you. Uh, but these are the things that I want to talk about. Planning your garden, uh, checking tools and equipment. Um, this is a great time of year to uh, not only think about you know, working in your garden, but actually doing some work, uh, cleaning and creating your beds. We'll talk a lot about the importance of soil and preparing your soil for your gardens, um, you know, how um, intense the, the planting is going to be, especially in the herb and veggies. Uh, pruning is a wonderful time of year, especially this time of, you know, we're actually doing a lot of pruning right now. Um, not some things, we'll talk a little bit maybe about that as well. Dividing perennials and getting those, um, especially grasses, this is a great time of year to do that. Planting and transplanting, again, if things are dormant, uh, you know, what are these uh, trees and shrubs? And then protecting your bed, we'll close that up out with that. So, so I talked about, you know, just a minute ago, the, the contemplative time, the you know, peaceful time of the year. This is a really good time. I know my dad, he's a farmer, he sits around with like seed catalogs, y'all know do that as well, and he kind of dreams about this type of turf greens that he farms for me. Um, but you know, I like to I like to doodle in my notebook. Um, I like to think about not only projects around the shop, but you know, things about my garden, my customers' gardens and um, what we're gonna be doing and you know, based on the weather a lot of times, you know, when we'll be cutting back this field when we'll be uh, pruning roses and things like that. And then designing, uh, Kathy mentioned we have a gardens division. So it's a nursery market, kind of half and half. Um, the retail side is what we call the nursery market. It's an acre and a half of land, uh, lots of greenhouse space, but also a big uh, showroom um, where we have house plants and pottery, like you mentioned. Uh, but upstairs, uh, what we call the upstairs part is the gardens division. We have two landscape designers or gardens designers. Uh, both are actually Incidentally, graduates of Mississippi State. Uh, one's a uh, younger, um, kind of starting her career, and one is a, a gentleman named Stephen Killebrew. So Anne is the younger designer who's come on recently, and Stephen Killebrew's been with. Uh, he was he worked for Plato, uh, so Greg's father. So he's been doing this for a long time. Very very talented people. Um, and kind of what you see there on the right, we do a lot of renderings, um, so people can conceptualize the, the gardens that they were asking us to create. And um, but this is a great time of year to put your pen to paper, your ideas down, um, and start thinking about what you want your garden to look like based on your experience with it um, and what you hope for. Mentioned earlier on the list, uh, it's a wonderful time to get your tools ready, pruners, especially if you're using those, um, cleaning you know, your wheelbarrows and shovels and getting all this stuff ready so when you are in the garden, 
you're not going to be working with something that I think is going to hurt your plants um, or make it a lot harder on yourself. Cleaning and creating beds. Um, so I, I call it with my clients, I say, you know, kind of creating the foundations or you know, building the templates for your gardens. This is, like I said, a wonderful time of year to do that. Um, you know, whether it be actually cutting in to sod and creating those spaces, uh, removing unwanted, and I use that word, or you know, kind of wanted to highlight it because we have a tendency, <clears throat> especially in the past, I think it's changing a lot, I'm seeing, but not all leaves really need to be removed. Um, in fact, some of them, if not most, can be repurposed, especially if you're mulching and things like that. Um, if you don't know already, um, leaf matter and debris, uh, all of the uh, invertebrates that are, you know, the worms, um, the larva of fireflies, you know, light bugs, those are the, those are the places that those animals are living uh, while you know, they're waiting to emerge and um, you know, from their you know, kind of more metamorphosized. So leaving things like leaves, um, you notice here I've got a uh, small point it might be of a, uh, that might be goldenrod or something like that, you know, cutting maybe half of it down so the native bees can uh, harbor in there over the winter. Um, so I, I just encourage you to be thoughtful about what needs to be removed and what, you know, might actually benefit you know, your garden, both from an amendment standpoint eventually in terms of leaves, but also for, um, you know, a, a home for some of our native uh, pollinators and you know, vertebrate friends. Um, probably, you know, this may start have started with, um, you know, I thought a lot about this kind of why I'm so passionate about the soil, um, but when I think about gardening, I really think about, you know, and, and I think this goes back to the farming background, but, you know, we used to farm the soil so that our corn and beans and, and tomatoes and those types of things would produce for us. So, I, again, there is a lot of, of need to kind of babysit your plants and kind of, you know, work with them. If you do the preparatory work in the soil, a lot of those problems will solve themselves. We'll talk about some of those things, but uh, you know, aeration, um, amendments, uh, creating a living environment or ecosystem, that's something I've become really interested and passionate about lately. Um, you know, understanding the microbiome that uh, works symbiotically with our plants and um, that kind of stuff. But it really does start, your garden success in my belief, um, you know, I'm a proponent of that, that success will start you know, below the ground. Um, so one of the things, especially in our soil, we'll talk a little bit about the native soils we have in Memphis here, but uh, which we have really great soils, but you know, some, sometimes it's too much of a good thing. Um, our small part particulates in the soil, our small uh, our high CECs as they call them, um, create a lot of problems from an aeration standpoint. They're so small the particles are, it's hard, it's hard for uh, a lot of times uh, over get compaction just from traffic or from moisture going in there. Uh, you don't have a lot of air and you, you guys hopefully you know, know that um, air is just as important below the ground as, as it is above our plants. They need to breathe, <clears throat> they need to be able to move moisture and nutrients in and out of their, um, their root systems and they can't do that in an anaerobic environment. They need a ro aerobic environment for themselves but also for um, <coughs> organs and organisms that live underneath them. So, Alleviating things like uh, compaction, which is a major issue here. Um, it could be as simple as just taking a bow rake and you know, kind of scratching the surface a little bit so you don't have a hard pan at the surface. I mentioned leaving some leaf litter. Um, the worms will come if you, if you leave it. I had a kind of a simple experiment. It really didn't start that way, but I just wanted to start doing something with my kitchen scraps. So I got a little you know, uh, stainless steel bucket, uh, filled it up pretty much once a week, if not twice, and I had a little spot that we never did anything with outside our house. And I would just go out there with a spade, you know, shovel up a, basically, a, you know, shovel a load of dirt, turn it over, put that in there, put the, dump the, the bucket in the, uh, in the ground, and put the soil on top of it. And I, so, <clears throat> back up a little bit, and I hope I'm not boring you with the story, but it was fascinating to me. When we first moved into our house at Chickasaw Gardens, there was a huge oak that the former owner had taken out. Um, I would say that thing was probably close to four, maybe you know four and a half foot in diameter. Uh, we had it ground down because you just literally couldn't walk that side of the property uh, and get to 
the case without having them removed. When I started to dig and cultivate in that area, it was the gum of the clay, the real, I mean, just gray, nasty, you know, kind of smells. <clears throat> and that's what I would shovel at first. And within, I don't think I'm exaggerating, but within four to six months, the purest, clean, black dirt, you know, crumbled in your hands, so sweet. Um, it was amazing to me. It's just these wads of, of worms. I mean, just fistfuls of them. Um, so anyway, it can be done quickly um, by adding that material. They will come. If you feed them, they will come. So that can that, that alone. I mean, again, other than just you know those spades um, and putting that organic matter in there. That's all the aeration had to do. Um, this time of year, especially, we, we get this kind of monsoon season, right? And it's not over. We're probably in the middle of it. Um, we are seeing a lot today, last night. I mean, well, hopefully, you know, y'all are okay, but you know, there are major drainage issues um, out there. And we, we work with a lot of those. And, and I see this more often than not these days, especially as we're getting more infill. The people are building in places like, I mean, I don't say the contractors aren't being thoughtful, but they basically that really don't have an alternative. So I've got customers back gardens or backyards that there is, they're below grade and there's no way to get that out. And so we're building these cistern systems as you kind of see here, it looks like milk grades, but they are a uh, product called aqua blocks. And we'll, we'll put a sump pump in there that's, uh, and it'll activate itself once it's filled up. Uh, but we're doing more and more of that. Dry creek beds, we do a lot. Uh, walkways, we're using a lot more gravel these days. Uh, so crushed limestone is a really great product for that to get you above the, you know, so it has time to actually percolate through. Um, so there are a lot of really creative ways to deal with um, drainage issues, um, even if you think you, you know, you're, you're living in a, you know, a bowl, you know. Um, so we, we, um, we do that, and there are ways to, to kind of, you know, work around, um, and with nature, hopefully, um, building rain gardens and that type of stuff. So this, I converted it to a PDF. Some of the images looks like it didn't come convert here. Um, what I was, I think this, was, this um, slide was talking about was amending your soil. And this, this product here is, uh, there are many of them that go like this, but this in particular is uh, Melorganite. When you, when you feed the soil, I think this is the name, the title of the slide, um, it's really feeding the soil. Think about it, that's what I you know, encourage you to think about. The, the plants don't feed directly from the nutrients, the micronutrients that we put down. They, the soil has to be, it has to convert it down into um, usable, if you will, bite sizes for those, so they can actually be moved into it. So we need to put nitrogen, phosphorus, and, and um, potassium down. Um, I'd also encourage you to think about you know, macro or micronutrient you know, kind of introductions. You know, is it, do you need acids in your soil, manganese, um, you know, crop specific even sometimes. Uh, and, and I don't think it's on, I can't remember if it's on another slide here, but, uh, but again, feeding the, the microorganisms that live within the soil. Um, I'm, a, I'm a big proponent because I've seen results of it, but organic, uh, for a number of reasons, uh, versus an inorganic or um, you know, a, uh, you know, a chemical-based or a petrol-based uh, fertilizer. The benefits, in my opinion, are you don't have you don't run the risk of burning your crop or your your plants. Um, you're actually feeding the soil instead of sometimes you know, sort of burning it, if you will, um, and it's a slow release. And so those are, those are some of the benefits of going organic and adding compost, especially. That was the other uh, part of the slide. Um, our soils, like I mentioned, very high in iron. Uh, because of that small amount of the clay soil we have and that small um, particle size, really good soil moisture retention. That's almost too much of a good thing. What we are at a deficit of is um, organic matter, and especially if you're dry, you know, if you're growing high uh, nutrient demanding you know, crops or you know, um, ornamentals and bed, bedding plants like an herb or something like that, they're going to leach, you know, because of their a lot of leaf growth, uh, a lot of flower production. Those plants are built to, to consume, if you will, um, and they will they will yield a dearth of, of uh, food and, and nutrients in the soil. So, really, feeding your soil on an annual basis uh, is something I strongly encourage you. 
some of that you can do with the leaf matter, uh, some of it, you know, bringing in compost or, like I talked about here, uh, slow release fertilizers are a good way to do that. Um, I've mentioned this a couple of times, but we have small, you know, clay is the smallest, uh, so sand, you got sand on one spectrum and clay particles on the other side as far as size. Uh, the largest is being the sand, uh, the smallest. When you have that many small particles together, you have a lot more surface area for nutrients to hold on to, for moisture to hold on to. And that is very good for our plants, um, but we need to increase the ability for plants to actually grow and access those nutrients um, by adding organic matter. Um, so that's what's uh, really important here. Um, Here's, here's the organic uh, fertilizers I've talked about. And one of the ones we've had most success with is a product called Happy Frog, and there's some others out there. The reason that I think it's so important or such a, a great product is because it has a, it's inoculated with 16 or so uh, different varieties of what's called mycorrhizal fungi. Some of y'all may be aware of what that is. Uh, essentially has a symbiotic relationship with the roots of plants, and really all plants, um, whether it be uh, you know, hundred-year-old beech or a you know, hundred-day-old you know okra. Uh, they those plants, they're they're less apt to stress from water, uh, a, a um, absence of water. Uh, so it's <coughs> helpful from a water uh, stress alleviate uh, you know leaving water stress, but it's also access to nutrients. Um, slow release, non-burning, like I talked about. And one of the other things is if y'all aren't trying this, uh, really. Be really great to get your feedback on it. Uh, we've had great success with ornamentals is uh, hydrolyzed fish uh, fertilizer. So this is the plants that y'all probably know <coughs> and take nutrients in. They're amazing. I mean, the more I know about plants, the more I'm really amazed about them. But they can feed essentially through their skin. Uh, I mean, we do that to a degree. I mean, vitamin D through our, you know, through the sun and stuff like that. But these plants uh, through the stomata uh, can actually take in uh, things like hydrolyzed fish. Fish is very, very important because of the micronutrients it has. Um, and I would encourage you, you know, do your own research, but this product here in particular, new, uh, Neptune's, uh, it's a hydrolyzed fish, uh, emul it's not an emulsion, it's a hydrolyzed fish product, meaning that it's ground up fish, it's not uh, boiled down you know, fish uh, parts, if you will. That's very important because the amino acids are preserved when when processing is done this way, kind of a cold press versus a, you know, putting it in a big cooker. Um, I used to use fish emulsions, and those are great, but Make it was your own. night and day um, when I used hydrolyzed fish. Um, so I think especially if you're a fruit, veggie, herb producer, um, you know, a couple times during the growing season, I think you'll see some really, really amazing results. Um, you still want to use granular fertilizer or slow release. Uh, you can't, I don't, I personally don't believe you can only do um, the foliar feeding, but it is amazing the results I think you'll get um, and see. It's very similar um, if you're growing the, any of your uh, herbs or veggies, uh, flowers in containers, making sure that you use the right soils there. <clears throat> that same product uh, from a fertilizer perspective, this group, uh, Fox Farms is the name of them out in California, uh, but Happy Frog is their, one of the, their primary products. Um, we've had a lot of success with the product you see on the left here, um, Ocean Forest. This has some of the fish, same fish um, crustaceans and other things in it. Um, and it's also got bacteria <laughs> and some worm castings in it. I mean, it is crazy. I have a friend, uh, I don't know if any of y'all have ever tried uh, Jacko's Pepper Jelly. It's kind of random, but. Um, here in Memphis, there's a, a lady, um, she makes it, and she grows all the peppers in her uh, front yard. I mean, I don't have a tell how hot she's got, it's crazy. It looks like a forest of uh, habaneros or whatever she's uh, got going on there. But um, she came to me, her name's Lee, she's awesome. Uh, uh, Lila, excuse me. And she was like, hey, do y'all have miracle Grow?" And I was like, what are you growing? And she said, well, these are for my peppers. And I said, don't use that, use ocean forest. And she was like, well, all right, and this is not, it's not, you know, cheap, it's, it, but it, anyway, she came and um, get back to me the next year, and she said, I was all in one, all in one is ocean forest, she said, and she showed me pictures, and she did a trial by trial, because she still had some, um, some of the miracle Grow uh, product, and uh, I mean, it looked like a different plant, it was so much happier, and production of it, so 
again, if you are doing a container garden, I, I would strongly encourage you to consider the soil you use it. And it really does make a difference, the mycorrhizal fungi, but also uh, the products that are in there. Um, one thing, if y'all haven't read this book, if that is of interest to you, I'll just uh, put a plug in for um, Peter Warman, uh, Wolleyman's book here, Hidden Life of Trees. Um, I think the science is getting there. In fact, it probably was further along than I know of um, in the kind of scientific you know, periodicals and stuff. But he, he breaks it down as a very well, in my opinion, written book of the layman. And he's a, he, he documents this, he is a, uh, an old growth forest uh, manager, steward, if you will, in, um, in the Bavarian forest of Germany. And he, his job is basically to take care of these beech trees. And it's just really a beautiful story about essentially trees communicating with one another, protecting one another, feeding their young, uh, you know, telling a, another part of the forest that there's an invasion of, of wasps, um, you know, and they will send out these other cannons. Uh, the other ones, you know, they, the way they communicate, he's saying, is this quote unquote neural network, this communication network, using the, the mycorrhizal, those same fungi uh, down below the soil. So again, if that's of interest to you, I, I think it's a fascinating, uh, beautiful story about uh, beings uh, that I don't think we really give you know, a lot of credit to. I think trees, um, you know, are, I think they, you know, I hate to use too strong a term, but I think there are feelings. I mean, I think there's very little that we understand about that side of, you know, you guys are here, you love plants. I mean, I think there's a lot more that we can learn and a lot more in common we have with them uh, that we may love. Um, Somewhat along that same line, there's another thought I have, and it'll come to me in a second, but uh, Peter's book is great, and um, anyway, there was something else that kind of popped in my head, but I'll get off that um, before y'all start crying. <laughs> so this is also a great time to mention, we're doing a lot of pruning right now. Uh, we just cut back a lot of wisteria, roses we hit um, maybe the last two or three weeks. This is cold snap. A week or so ago kind of scared me with it but they're pretty resilient and i think um you know especially with the rosettes out there i think you know removing stuff earlier than later cleaning your you know your your equipment your tools um but i think this is a great time of year to do the, the selective pruning that you need to do um you know, don't go out there and, and cut all your your big big hydrangeas um hand them close you can we've been doing a lot of um, like especially the big tree form uh tardivos and the Limelights, we've been cutting them back pretty good. The Annabelles, uh, Hydrangeas, uh, like I mentioned Roses. There's probably some other ones that I haven't thought of yet. Uh, oh, and then, I mean, I don't know if I mentioned this, but I just wrote an article for the Central Gardens uh, Association for the newsletter, and, you know, Kat, the lady that asked me to write it, said, you know, maybe you can talk about some of the damage that we've all had or seen, especially, I don't know if y'all driven through or you live in Central Gardens, um, the places in Midtown and you know others parts of town were really hit hard. You know these huge canopies. Yeah, you know, there's a silver lining in my mind. You know some of the dead wood was removed naturally that way. Um, some of the what we call regenerative pruning, uh, we, we were forced to do. Like in my garden, I've got some beautiful English laurels that had gotten kind of out, out of hand. I've been waiting. You know, I just they're so pretty. They're really healthy. Um, but this, you know, with the ice, they were doubled over, and I just had, you know, me and my guys went out and cut them down. And they looked really sad, like sticks. And these were you know, six, seven foot, you know, laurels that were maybe four to five foot wide. And now they're literally, you know, a two by two plant. Boxwoods can handle that. Um, you know, azaleas, this is the time of year to do those regenerative prunings. I mean, if, if you've got indica azaleas that are 12 foot tall over your windows and your doorways, can do that and it's okay it'll take a couple years for them to you know look like they should um, but you know wintergreen boxwoods american boxwoods um, those plants get out of control because sometimes either you know former owners or ourselves we don't understand how big they're going to get um, when we put them in places that they weren't necessarily um, built to, to grow in so you can do those those types of prunings um, Right now, winter, late fall, it's a great time to do that. You're minimizing uh, pest infestations. You know, anytime you create a wound, uh, pest, that's an open place for um, fungal, you know, diseases, pests to get in. Um, so doing that this time of year, you've got a more sterile, quote unquote, environment to do that. Um, 
do it on your um, your non old wood bolt. You know, so I mentioned don't go out and drive you know your nice taps and your you know, big modified drain engines. This is you know those are those are they need old growth to grow on. You can take the old cans out. Um, that's kind of hard to do uh, to know, you know which cans are old and dead versus the new ones. Um, after the frost, um, there are a lot of plants that you can you know prune on that are more tender. Some of the um, the evergreen perennials and things like that. Um, Immediately after flowering, y'all y'all probably know this, um, but your azaleas, you know, take them out. You know, if you're gonna if you're gonna do some pruning, um, even light pruning or shearing, I would advise uh, that you're doing that. You know, during their growth cycle versus their flowering. So you know, don't interrupt and lose those those flowers. So, um, and then there are always there are times when you know it's not optimal, but you got to do it because um, we've got storms you know that come through middle of the summer, you know, spring, fall. Um, and we need to get those out there. We've done a lot of pruning of crepe myrtles. I'm sure many of you, if not all, are aware of the bark scale um, infestation that we have here. Um, opening up the canopies of crepe myrtles, um, even if it's you know in the middle of summer, I would highly advise that. The more light and air you can get in the, the, the canopy of your crepe myrtles, the less susceptible, because uh, you're basically minimizing a, a environment that those insects will like. Uh, and so we've been doing that a lot, uh, and taking out, you know, whole canes of you know, 30, 40, you know, 60 year old, you know, big old mattress crate myrtles that you know, we're taking down 30 foot sections of those so we can, we can uh, increase that uh, air flow in the uh, canopy there. This is our, my favorite time of year to divide perennials uh, and apparently this lady's as well. Uh, <laughs> I think especially grasses um, and pampas grass, which I think she's wailing on right there. Is, a, is one that you can take an axe to. I mean, we have cut them out with chainsaws and, you know, you just quarter them up. But, um, you know, ornamental grasses, especially the native ones, like switch grasses are becoming much more popular. Hopefully you all have some of those in your sunnier parts of your garden. Uh, they are some of my favorite plants. I've kind of learned to, to incorporate more in design and, and work with over the last, you know, five to 10 years. And um, they don't like to be leggy a lot of times, especially, you know, when we add too much organic matter, sometimes we're producing too much um, you know, green on them. So divide them if you can, they'll be much happier for it. Um, and you'll have more plants to share with your friends or put in other parts of your garden. Uh, this is the time of year to do that kind of work. Uh, a lot of people call me, I mean, I don't know, I mean, I, I would say more often than not, I get a very surprised look uh, from my clients when I'm saying, we need to plant a tree now. You know, we're really like 20 years ago, we didn't want to plant a tree, but. Um, <laughs> But during the dormant time of year is when you want to put a, a tree in the ground. Um, it lets it heal in, as they say. Um, we have stressful summers and, and certainly even you know late springs. Um, but if you put a tree in late May, June, that's that's going to be a tough road to hope for that plant uh, to try to you know to, to endure not only the stress of a new environment, um, but you know the, the heat and the beat down that it will get. So, you know, be kind to trees, especially bigger ones, you know, they're big investments. Um, put them in when they're dormant. I would say the same for shrubs, um, uh, especially the, um, our deciduous shrubs. They don't, they're, they're asleep. I mean, it really doesn't matter. So anytime from late fall to, you know, May, I, I would say, um, the earlier the better though, um, if you can get them in the ground. Um, you don't want to put things, obviously, you know, we don't have, they're not really even avail, available, but you know our herbaceous, um, very tender plants, annuals and things like that. Um, you know those are the types of things that you want to wait until our frost threat of frost is gone, um, which is I was surprised. I thought this was later, um, but I think maybe because of our you know climate change. You know, I think the average um, date now it used to be in the 20s, if not late 20s of March, um, is now around March 19th is our last day of frost. So. It's earlier, um, which is good. I mean, it means we're only a couple weeks away from really being able to plant. Um, I think the, the latest that we've ever had a frost in Memphis, I did some research a while ago, was April 25th, there was a frost. Uh, but that was you know, 50, 60 years ago. So I don't think that's too common these days. A lot of you know, old school you know, uh, uh, planter uh, gardeners in town will tell you the 15th of April, or, you know, we have customers that come in, they'll look at, you know, all the petunias in the world all through March and, you know, they come April, then they'll be ready to plant. But I think you'll, you'll, be, more, you'll be safe, you know, mid to late March um, if you want to get some of your herbs in the ground. Sorry, I didn't mistake. 
but you know, do some research. Um, you guys know your plants, but um, you know, come to a place like us. We love to talk about plants. Uh, me and my staff. So if you're, you know, want to ask questions about new cultivars, what we're hearing from our growers, um, you know, we love to. You know, if you don't buy anything that day, that's fine. You're doing your research. Um, it's just a very welcoming place. I hope they'll support your independent nurseries and, and garden centers around right town. Uh, but do your own research as well. Um, this will be the last section I close with, but um, you've done all this investment in time, planting them, you know, hopefully protecting the soils, you know, even putting some plants in the ground. Um, you know, think about protecting those, that investment and, um, you know, in your time and money. Double hammer or even, you know, better triple hammered uh, hardwood mulch is great. Um, I'm a huge advocate of pine needles and there's a number of reasons why I could go into them, but essentially I think they're better soil amendment. They don't run as much and those are really the two biggest ones. And I think the other one I'd say is there's a benefit. We have naturally acidic soils here, but I think there's a benefit from acidifying your soils with pine needles as well. So. Um, we, I try to encourage most of our clients to use them. Some people don't like the aesthetic of it, and I totally get that. I mean, if you're from South Georgia, maybe you've seen too many pine needles, but, you know, uh, but I think they're a great, great um, amendment, and um, especially on slopes, I'll just, you know, say you know, one last thing is they, they don't, once they lock in, they're really good uh, for erosion control. The other thing I would say is, you know, I still say an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of or something like that. I mean, it really is true. Um, and I know this is, this is um, a topic that y'all may be sensitive to since you're working a lot with edibles, uh, but there are some good alternatives from a pre-emergent perspective. But we are on a four time a year, um, for most of my clients, a four time a year pre-emergent program. Um, I think a minimum of two years, or two times a year. Um, and once you get in that regimen, I think you'll see the benefits of it. Um, it's a heck of a lot easier to prevent a weed than to pull it. Um, and, you know, especially if you, we, I'm not saying you can't or don't, um, but I don't think glyphosate or, or Roundup is going to be around a lot longer. Um, there'll probably be, you know, some other chemistries that come along with it, but we are slowly, I wouldn't say even slowly, I mean, we pretty much moved away from post emergent herbicides. Um, there's just too much of a risk for both my men and, you know, my clients, and I just, you know, don't want to put, you know, any more of that down than we have to. Um, sometimes on walkways and, you know, I, I mean, it's just, I think we know too much about that stuff now to, to be using that. Um, you know, so a pre-emergent, although it is a herbicide, it's more of a, a hormonal, you know, kind of effect on the plant. It doesn't let the seed germinate. Um, and corn gluten, if y'all haven't, you started, if y'all haven't heard or read about that, actually is a great um, organic uh, alternative to to that. It also helps amend the soil. So you know, do some research, like I said, on your own, but uh, corn gluten can be a, a very good um, alternative to, um, to chemistries from a pre-emergent perspective in an edible bed. Um, we mentioned this a few times in different ways, um, <laughs> but just so you know, you know, my, Micronutrients, sulfur being one of them, um, is very, very important. Uh, all of our plants and trees really benefit from more um, acid. <clears throat> and, you know, if you're an ornamental gardener, you know, and you want blue hydrangeas, you want to put down sulfur, um, you know, you want deep pink ones, you might even need to alkalinize, uh, put down a little lime or something like that. Um, but sulfur is really great as well from a fungicidal perspective, again, kind of preventative. And I don't know this for a fact, but you know, things that I've read, um, insects don't like it. Um, that's one of the other benefits um, of pine needles. We tend not to have ticks and mites <clears throat> that we would in other, um, because of the acidic uh, environment. Um, so, this is a question I just, you know, protecting your beds. A lot of people think, oh, let me put this shield down to keep weeds from ever germinating. Um, I wanted this, you know, kind of to do away with that fantasy. Unfortunately, what happens is you put down fabric and maybe for a season or two, um, you might have you know, weed suppression, but the, the mulches and the soils and those leaves that decay above it, those become the medium for the seeds to germinate in. And then you've got a real problem on your hand because you've got weeds growing through it and under it. Um, landscape fabric is a wonderful product to use, um, in, in especially in our environment, uh, but I would advocate that you only use it really or think about it under gravel or oversized rock, like in the drainage areas, because our soils are so 
uh, find a silt, right? And if y'all have done this before, you probably ran into it or seen this. The gravels invariably move um, in down into the soil and vice versa, the soil will move up. That will not happen if you use um, a landscape fabric under a, a gravel pathway. It's amazing how long I've got my entire backyard, because uh, I'm under a bunch of magnolias, is nothing but crushed limestone number eight. Um, and I put down landscape fabric probably close to 15 years ago. And I mean, I get a, a few little weeds that germinate above ground, but nothing. And it's easy just to kind of rake them through. Um, and, you know, I don't have any soil coming through. It's a really great application, but I would think, very much think twice uh, before putting it under, you know, and around your, your plant materials. That's it. Uh, oh, I do have one other thing. Um, but thank you again. Uh, this was fun. I love talking about this stuff. Um, so hopefully that wasn't uh, too long or too boring. Um, I didn't go off on too many tangents, but there's so much stuff in my head when I start talking about this. If y'all ever want to get in touch with us, um, please come by the nursery. It's a fun place just to go. I one of the things I was you know impress or try to impress upon my staff is I want somebody to feel better when they come in. Um, you know than they did when they walk, you know, when they leave our store, than, they, than when they walk through the door. It's a very experiential place. I mean, it's, it's hard not to be experiential when you're around beautiful plants and stuff, um, but it's a fun place. The staff is really fun and energetic. Um, there's usually pretty good music going on and uh, just fun stuff to look at. And uh, so y'all come by if you can, um, call us. That's our email if you want to uh, reach out and ask any questions. And then we are on social media, uh, Facebook and Instagram is a great way to keep up with you know, stuff that's coming in or events that are happening um, is Urban Earth Mem. And the last thing I wanted to talk about, I've got some flyers. Uh, I'm not trying to steal uh, Kim's thunder with these, but, um, but y'all grab one of these too if you can, because we would love to invite you. We're gonna have a, a spring party or a flicker fest, we're calling it. And um, this will be really fun. We're gonna have a, uh, An event a second event. line band. We're gonna have uh, the, uh, Lucky Seven Brass Band. We're having uh, three or four different musicians uh, playing. We'll have activities for kids and grandkids, like face painting, balloons. Um, Cheryl, one of our um, staff members, is going to put on a, a seed, you know, planting. Um, there'll be food trucks and you know, door prizes, whatever. It'll just be fun. Hopefully, it'll just be a good time. To see some people that you you know talk about plants and be in a, in a pretty environment. So y'all come. It's the Saturday before Easter. I know um, hopefully y'all aren't uh, too busy, but uh, stop by from 11 to 3, and, and there's no cost. Just you know, come by and have fun with us and help celebrate, kick off a great spring. It's been a little while since we've been able to get together outside. Uh, you know, so uh, hope y'all can come. Thank you again. Oh, I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions if y'all if you have time. Uh, <coughs> Beneficial nematodes would be another one, I think. Um, we sell both of those, um, uh, nematodes and, um, but yeah, I think, you know, one, I would say the science is still catching up with, you know, our, our understanding of what, you know, should be out there. So I wouldn't just go willy-nilly throwing anything out there. But the other thing I would say is there's probably not, I think the, uh, the commercialization, because the science isn't there yet, hasn't gotten too, you know, far along. So. I think it would definitely be safe in most products that are, um, you know, look at the analysis, look at the, you know, Happy Frog does a really good job of putting exactly what species that they have um, and they're inoculating their soils with. Um, but anything that has a, a you know, beneficial fungi like a mycorrhizal, I think you will see dramatic uh, results from. Eli, I saw your hand up. Well, I like, I mean, really anything that adds color. I think marigolds are pretty traditional, um, right? You know that plant? Um, it's a good scent. A lot of people say it will keep rodents and things away. Um, I think anything that you can do to increase uh, pollinators. So, you know, a lot of times we're planting in sun environments, right? Because we want our plants to grow. So, you know, perennials like uh, salvias, uh, lobelia, um, I like, certainly like a lot of butter, uh, uh, Milkweeds and butterfly weeds are coming along. Um, we're seeing more uh, commercialization of those. You'll see some monarchs. Um, even the herbs themselves, one of my favorite memories of gardening with my daughter, uh, she's a little bit older than you, she's 16 now, um, but we had the crazy idea to try to grow parsnips one year, which, you know, y'all know, no to say the place for carrots or parsnips, right? <laughs> but the fun thing about that was, that is, as y'all probably know, the host of the black swallowtail. 
It's a beautiful plant, or a beautiful caterpillar, a large butterfly, turn. And I noticed all these little instars. I had to research what it was at first, and then I said, okay, what's the host? You know, what what is the the what are parsnips a host of? And then I, you know, then I learned it was um, black swallowtails, and so we gathered those. I probably had fifteen or sixteen, you know, by the end of the, the run there, and we gathered them up, and she took them to her kindergarten school once they had you know crystallized, and um, they released them as a as a class. So even some of your herbs can be fun, um, you know, as quote unquote you know kind of host for flower or pollinators. But I would encourage you to things that are going to bring in your honeybees and your butterflies, um, hummingbirds, things like that, because they're going to help your um, your veggies and your herbs, you know, benefit from those as well. Anybody else have questions? Yes, sir, go ahead, Nick. In my master gardening class uh, last, this particular week, they talked about uh, using forest manure or cow manure. Yep. That's compost, but they said be, be aware a little bit because some of the hay is sprayed yep. with a chemical, and it, mm -hmm. that, in the process they eat it, they expel it out, and then it goes to compost, and the spray stays in the compost for maybe up to two years. And it I think that's very true. When you put it on your bed, it may be too hot. And yes. Oh, yeah. So that's the big, big thing. How do you tell? How do you tell? Well, you got to know. I mean, I think there, I mean, you, hopefully you'll know your source and, you know, yeah. your growers are feeding. Right. I mean, if I were, a, you know, especially a horse farmer, I mean, you know, I wouldn't be putting down. I, w I would not want to know what, you know, the, where, you know, the alfalfa was coming from for my horses. Um, the other thing I'd say is you know, using cow manure because it has multiple stomachs is going to be better than a horse manure. You won't get as much uh, weed germination, um, you know, from a from a, a cow's manure than you will. Um, the other thing is if you like cow manure or that type of product, uh, black cow is a wonderful product, um, mm -hmm. and uh, we sell that, and it's a great. I mean, nope. not that one of the best. I would say you know just straight uh, organic amendments. What else, y'all? We're, we're back until 1230 is what Nick said, right? <laughs> so, yes, ma'am. On these big, big azaleas that we have now, the, the big ones, they're not No, I don't think so. Well, well they, won't, they won't get problems. That's right. Oh, yeah. Even if you cut up, I mean, if you if you do quote unquote a regenerative prune, and I'm talking about taking something that may be 10 feet down to two. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's, let me, let me tell you too, like, Sometimes it's better to move something like that, um, so you're not running into that situation again. Even if, especially if you're going to transplant something, and this is just in general, if you're ever transplanting something large, like it's a you know good time of year to do that. Uh, <clears throat> you want to do what's called reciprocal pruning, quote unquote. So when you when you cut the roots, when you when you extract a tree, especially or a large shrub from the ground, invariably you're going to miss some of those fine roots that are around the perimeters of their root balls. Um, and you're not doing anything wrong, it's just physically impossible to get all of those roots. Uh, but in order to compensate for that, um, plants are, you'll probably see images. I mean, it, they're almost mirror uh, images of each other above and below the soil. Their branching structures uh, from the root perspectives very much emulate or kind of mirror what's above ground. And so when you take those roots down, you want to bring the canopy down as well so you're not asking a plant that has been basically you know, half of its moisture and soil, you know, nutrient generating capabilities, you're not asking it to, to, uh, to support the foliage it had before. But I would say if you, the best time of year to do a regenerative prune is now, um, you know, even because the stress of plant, what happens a lot of times, I mean, and there's a lot of, that goes into this, but I'm trying to consolidate it, but when you cut it for an azalea, you were to take a, a GG Gerving and an indica azalea down, say in late May, right after it's bloom, or even you know, mid-May, it's got enough time to start to regenerate new growth, new shoots. And that's not a bad thing, um, but you know, come fall or, or winter, those are gonna be probably pretty tender growth, and then you've got the potential for burn on that, on that new growth. So cutting it back, it may be a little counterintuitive, but cutting them back really dramatically this time of year uh, is actually a much better solution. You're exactly right. It may be two years before you actually get you know a, a good, nice you know kind of uh, rebloom on some of those. But you're doing yourself and that plant a, a huge favor by doing it this time of year. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. So, is this the time to avoid this kind of I do. Um, now, there's um, it's not the only time. Um, so, 
we were taking, you know, some of our, uh, you know, hybrids and, you know, cutting roses. Nice. It's a beautiful plant. Oh yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, and roses here are kind of semi deciduous, so you can even strip them. In fact, a lot of people would advocate that you take all the whole foliage off um, and force it to grow new because that's. I mean, I think the the thought there is you're you're making it much less susceptible to diseases, fungal and black spots coming on. But stripping them down, cutting them down, I wouldn't do this for a, I don't know how old that new dog is, but you know, maybe after three or four years, you're doing these you know hard prunings. Um, we've got a client with a huge arc uh, over her. We're not taking that down to the ground. We are thinning, um, you know, some of the newer canes and stuff, um, or even weaving them in. Um, but a lot of our cutting roses, certainly the knockouts and, and the drift roses right now, we're taking them down. You know, some of those plants are only you know 16 you know or less inches tall. When they first start to flush back out, we'll do another plant, you know, so then we'll do what I call kind of a fine tuning. Um, you know, you want that basket, you know, the roses, the rosarians will tell you kind of should look like an open hand like that. So when they send out the new suckers on the inside, that's when you want to kind of cull those and you want to direct those out. And out. Um, so there's a, it's a, it's a, it might be another, you know, cutting, depending on how fast it, when we have, we had a really good growing season last year. Um, so there might be a, another reason to do some pruning later in the season, but usually two at the most is what we're doing. This time of year to kind of set the structural, I call it, maybe I'd call it structural pruning, and then um, kind of aesthetic pruning would be our next round. Um, we'll do that in late March once they start to, to send the new you know, suckers out. So, yes, so you're saying taking the knockout roses down to 66? Well, it depends on, I mean, some of them, well, part of it would be kind of architecturally, you know, do you need them lower, you know, can they be lower? Um, I like to take them back to the thicker canes. Um, they'll flush still, I think it actually helps them bloom better. Um, there may be aesthetic or architectural reasons you want to leave them taller, but there's no reason, I mean, most of the, the, the I'm trying to think of, 24 inches maybe is kind of probably our average on what we're taking them back at. We just did a big garden that has this mass, I don't know if y'all know the variety, it's a truly a child sport uh, called Cinco de Mayo, really pretty uh, red, kind of orangey uh, blue, uh, kind of smoky, and um, yeah, we took them most, mostly back to about 18, 24 inches. Yes, ma'am? So I have um, a rose, I think it's Lady Rains. Oh yeah? I got it at your store. Okay. And Yellow or white bloom maybe? It doesn't bloom. Oh. But I, but that's because I don't know what I'm doing. Right. So I I it's on a trellis. Yeah. And I have just let it grow. Okay. And it's grown beautifully. But I have never pruned it. And I need to give it love. Mm -hmm. I need to know what I need to do to my rose. I I fed it okay. um, in the spring. Yeah. But I have not pruned it or because I wanted it to yeah, go across exactly. my trellis. And it's grown quite well across my trails. But I need, do I, what do I do? Yeah, Lady Banks is a, it's kind of a different animal um, than a lot of our cutting roses. So um, you have a, certainly want to have some flowers, but I don't think you're trying to force as many as you are in like your cutting roses or your, uh, so I think you're totally fine that you're letting it go over your art. I would just maybe thin it a little bit. One of the problems, quote unquote, with our Lady Banks is they can get so aggressive sometimes. I mean, they'll pull trellises off the walls and they get so weighty. So if you can shape it, maybe thin some of the you know the internal canes. If you're not getting the blooms, my inclination would be it's not getting one enough sun or two. You might think about an acidifier, just a little bit of sulfur down there. Um, if you're feeding it, it should have what it needs to bloom. It just not may not be able to access that those nutrients. Um, Is there a particular food I need to give it? I would just do sulfur. Sulfur just, yeah, and sulfur. just regular fertilizer. So slow release, um, something higher, um, especially with the lady bank, something higher in phosphorus and potassium than in nitrogen. I would keep your, you know, you know what the analysis is, the NPK, the one, you know, you see the three numbers. Make sure that number in the front is as low as possible, okay. um, and have those because uh, potassium and phosphorus are both roots. And, and, uh, so shape flowers. it some and give it some sulfur and some food. Yeah. And now's the time. Uh, I'd wait on the, you could do that, sulfur's probably fine, but I'd wait a little bit on the, uh, the 
fertilizer, you'll get more benefit if you put it later. Um, this time of the year when they're dormant, it's just gonna sit in the soil and probably leach uh, before it becomes you know, a, useful for the plant. Do you wait on most fertilizer? The reason I'm asking is because um, I heard um, Diane may maybe, maybe she, yeah, Diane's great. who I re really respect, oh, she's but awesome. she said feed your babies on Valentine's Day. And so that's yeah. been my um, reminder to feed my babies on Valentine's Day. If you're using a slow release, I think you're in better you than, than you would be if you're using like a you know petro based uh, fertilizer for uh -huh. sure. Something that's gonna you know like I talked about the organic um, you know, but but I could wait a little longer. I think you can wait I mean, a little longer, yeah, but give it I'll, a sulfur now and thin it out. Yes, or do them all at the same time. Honestly, I mean it, okay. it, it it doesn't. The plants are dormant, so none of what you're doing right now is gonna immediately benefit them. You want to wait? I would say don't wait too long, but you know I'd say early to mid March at the latest. I uh, probably want to do that. So two to three weeks, you probably do something. I think it's yellow, but it doesn't bloom much. There is a but white plate mix as well. I think it's one. yellow. Yeah, yellow is the more traditional. Thing. Okay. Hey, yeah, Eli, what's up? Um, can you just let your roses go, um, grow wild? Because our neighbor, he basically has a abandoned house. Ah. Uh -huh. Sometimes, you know, that's a really good uh, point. Sometimes if we get out of our plants' way, they do a heck of a lot better. Um, but like, it's like a jungle. Yeah, so that's the problem, right? You know, you know, aesthetically, I mean, it doesn't look like they've been cared for, but yeah, I mean. said you're a big tea fan, maybe uh, you'll get some of your buddies here can brew some rose hip tea for you. It's supposed to be really good. It's got high in vitamin C. Mm -hmm. like, the, on my sister's birthday, it seemed all the roses just opened up. Yeah. Like, and it was like, it was like the Your mom and dad timed it right on that one, then. <laughs> <laughs> they knew what they were doing, apparently. Yeah. Uh, they'll put them in the back. Good. Oh, wow. All right, any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Have you ever heard of using crystals in the garden? What kind of crystals? Crystals and stones. Like stone? Yes. No? Um, and quartz. Yeah, I'm so, not, that is a really interesting question. I have not been asked that, um, but there are a lot of folks, I mean, from what I've read and understand, you know, believe that they give off energies. Yes, and, they do. Yeah. Just like caring for your plants. Yeah. Like physical level, they all go the same line. And energy. Yes. Yeah, I have not honestly heard of them. And using black tourmaline or black um, obsidian can actually mm -hmm. confuse mm -hmm. pests. Interesting. So away from the garden. I would love to learn more about that. That sounds like something super interesting to me because I think there's so much these you know yeah these things are you know not a lot of people know about this. But that's great. Thank you for bringing up that point. Can I go home now? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.